o'clock p.m. and I am all about being timely. So thank you to those of you who are just joining us. My name is Allison Titus. I am the Community Education Manager for the Laguna Foundation. This is the Laguna de Santa Rosa Community BioBlitz. This is the introductory webinar telling you a little bit more about how to use iNaturalist and how to contribute to our project, as well as give you a kind of a fun preview into the biodiversity you can find in the Laguna watershed this fall. It is, I just want to acknowledge that it is an eerie, maybe heavy feeling day looking out your window this evening. And I appreciate you choosing to spend some time here with us. Um, and I hope that it lifts your spirits a little bit as well as being a nice distraction. I'm joined today by Christine Fontaine, our education director here at the Laguna Foundation. She will be monitoring the chat and facilitating some Q&A sessions. We'll have one in the middle of the presentation and one at the end. Hi, Christine. Hi, Allison. Hello, everyone. We're so excited you're joining us for the first ever Laguna Watershed Community BioBlitz. All right. So I'm going to turn my video off in between the Q&A sessions. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and get started and let you focus on the beautiful slides I put together for you. I want to start with a little more information about who we are. The Laguna Foundation Community BioBlitz is a partner event hosted by Ag and Open Space and the Laguna Foundation. Established by visionary voters in 1990, the Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation and Open Space District, or Ag and Open Space, permanently protects the diverse agricultural, natural resource, and scenic open space lands of Sonoma County for future generations. What's really cool, in my opinion, is that the Sonoma County community voted to tax themselves to protect our natural and working land, seeing the value in all of this open space that we have here in the county. And as a result, the community has multiple benefits, such as clean and abundant water, naturally filtered by our watershed lands, that's a big one here at the Laguna Foundation too, food and fiber produced by local farming families, opportunities to get outside, to exercise or explore nature, or even perhaps make observations, and beautiful scenic landscapes that provide community character and a sense of place, a shared sense of place of Sonoma County. And this is probably on a lot of our minds now, open space adds resiliency to the effects of climate change and extreme events. Ag and open space primarily protects land in the unincorporated areas of the county, like the Laguna de Santa Rosa. To date, ag and open space has protected and is responsible for the ongoing stewardship of nearly 118,000 acres of working and natural open space lands in Sonoma County. The Laguna Environmental Center, Stone Farm, Lower Stone Farm, where we take learning Laguna students on field trips every year, Irwin Creek, Laguna Uplands Preserve, and many other beloved places along the main channel of the Laguna, as well as throughout the watershed, are ag and open space protected lands. We hope to host in-person bio blitzes on these lands in future years, but for this year, we will highlight other open spaces you can visit on your own to document biodiversity in the Laguna. And the Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization also established around the same time as Ag and Open Space in 1989. Our mission is to restore, conserve, and inspire appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa, Sonoma County's wetland of international importance. The Laguna is both a wetland and a watershed. And I'll get into more details about the boundaries and biodiversity of the Laguna throughout this presentation. Some of the critical restoration and conservation projects the Laguna Foundation works on include vernal pool monitoring for endangered species, vernal pool restoration, 
invasive species management and riparian restoration, which means planting and managing native plant species along creek banks. We also have a robust education program, including our Learning Laguna school program for third graders, summer programs for six to 11 year olds, and as you all know, our community education program, which hosts both online and in-person programs now for the public throughout the year. And all of these efforts would not be possible without our volunteers who are still involved remotely at this time and help us teach students about wetland ecology, host in-person events, tend our native plant garden at the Laguna Environmental Center, and steer the organization as our board members. Many of our volunteers are helping us out with the bio blitz and gathering observations. So thank you to those of you that are out there in the audience. This is our agenda for this webinar today. We are welcoming, you know, learning a little bit more about our hosts. We will get into the details of what iNaturalist is and how to use it, what a BioBlitz is, which may be a new term to some of you. And then we'll talk more about where the Laguna watershed boundaries are and what is within them during fall. California Biodiversity Day might be a new thing for some of you. I know I hadn't heard about it until last year. And that's because in 2018, Governor Brown launched the California Biodiversity Initiative with the goal of securing the future of California's biodiversity and integrating biodiversity protection into the state's environmental and economic goals and efforts. It's pretty new. He also designated California Biodiversity Day as September 7th of every year to celebrate and encourage actions to protect the state's exceptional biodiversity. The term biodiversity is a combination of the two words biological diversity, and it refers to the variety of life in a particular place. Though often measured as the number of species alone, it can be applied at various scales from genes to species to ecosystems. And California is rich in all of those. Think of our varied iconic landscapes in California, or even just in Sonoma County, and the multiple ecosystems within each type. Then imagine all the plants and animals that each ecosystem supports with each population containing a diverse gene pool. Of any state in the US, California has both the highest total number of species and the highest number of endemic species, which are species that occur nowhere else. We also have the most rare and imperiled species of any state with more than 30% of California species threatened with extinction. It's one of the most biodiverse regions in the world and one of 36 global biodiversity hotspots designated by Conservation International. These are areas containing exceptional concentrations of plant and animal endemism, but also experiencing high rates of habitat loss. So this is one of those events that is happening in celebration of what I think makes California so exceptional and so what an amazing place to live. And the same is true for Sonoma County as well. What is iNaturalist? You may be wondering. And it's a good question. iNaturalist is a free platform both an app and a website that allows people to share their observations of nature and create an official species occurrence record. Now, a species occurrence record in a museum looks a little different. It looks more like this, but it records important information that iNaturalist also captures with their observations. Not only can you make and share observations, when you're using iNaturalist. You can also get help with identifications. You can keep a personal species list 
and you can explore what other people have seen all over the world. Observations are primarily made through taking photos of things on a camera or smartphone. Like you can see my mom doing here. I caught her being candid on a hike. <laughs> um, and then you can upload those photos that you take on your phone, even if you don't know what you are looking at, if you don't know the species in front of you. iNaturalist has built in artificial intelligence or computer vision to help you get started with identifying your observation. And you can also just enter a rough guess. I do this all the time. You can start with just the type of taxa it is, what level you know. For example, I know this is a plant, or I know this is a bird, or maybe it's an insect. I know it's a butterfly. And then someone from the iNaturalist community will help you narrow down that observation. It's a huge database with millions of observations from around the world and hundreds of users. And many of those users are experts in their field that help curate the data, which is really an amazing connection to have. But why? <laughs> why use it? You know, knowing what it is may not be enough. It is, after all, a screen, yet another screen. I get it. However, it is fun and interesting to use, I have found, and I'm not someone who particularly loves screens. It really does help make observations. I also really like that you're able to, that personal species list aspect of it um, is really neat and it's really helpful for documenting things like climate change and how species are responding. And it captures important information like the date, time, and location and without even, you know, doing anything. It just is there on your phone. I also really enjoy that iNaturalist is an, a source, an open source of knowledge that anyone can access anywhere. And you, are, you would contribute to that community science effort by using iNaturalist. Also, this data does get used. It was used for over 225 scientific papers in 2019 alone. Research grade data, which is a term I'll get into in just a minute, um, is also incorporated into other scientific databases, such as the Global Biodiversity Information Facility and CalFlora, more locally. I'm going to get into the nitty gritty steps of how to use iNaturalist if you've never used it before. Might be helpful even if you have. So this screen, these screenshots that I'll show are from my own phone from using the iNaturalist app. So it really shows you exactly what it will look like. And I'll first go over what it's like to make an observation using the iNaturalist app and your smartphone. So this means you have downloaded the app from the app store and you've created an iNaturalist account. I'm not going to go over how to do that. So if you want some assistance with that, check out one of the emails I've sent you from Eventbrite and that iNaturalist getting started guide will help you with that. Once you've downloaded the app, and created an account, you will open the app and this is what your home screen will look like. If you haven't used iNaturalist before, it might not have any observations yet. What's important is this blue box, this outline down here, that's you, kind of where you navigate the app from. To make an observation, you hit the observe button. You can also use these other tools. You can explore a certain area around you. This means it'll pull up observations from a certain area that you wish to search. And you can also track activity around you. But I'm going to talk about what you do after you click the observe button. This means that you have found something you wanna make an observation of. Maybe it's a plant or an animal and you have it in front of you and you are ready to take a picture. When you hit the observe button, iNaturalist will access your camera, and then you wanna center your subject in your camera. Now, just because it's in the center isn't quite enough. You also need to focus your camera. As you can see over here, 
it may sound obvious, but not all smartphones are that great at getting things like flowers in focus. I have often found that it's helpful to move my phone away from the subject. I would just move it around a little bit until you get it in focus, clear, and then you click the green button to snap a photo. Seems easy enough. However, there is one thing I wanted to point out. If you're like me, if you see something coming across your path, maybe it's a bird when you're on a walk or a reptile moving quickly, you probably won't have time to open the app and hit that observe button. You might just pull up your camera on your phone and snap a picture. And that is fine. If you do that, you can take these same steps, but using this button, you can access your photos and upload a photo you already took. Once you have your photo, you click next to add some details. And you can really add a lot of details. First of all, you can add another photo. And I think that can be really helpful in certain situations. Maybe not for a California poppy, but for an oak tree, I think that would be useful. You can capture different parts of the organism if it's something like a fungus or a, a plant. I will go over more in the next slide. This is the fun part. This is where iNaturalist suggests what you might have seen. And then this section below is really that part that substitutes for an official species occurrence record. This is where you have your date, time, location, um, whether it was captive or cultivated, any projects you want it to apply to. Um, sometimes this might not show up depending on your location services for your phone. If you don't share your location with the app, this will not show up, um, but you can also enter that yourself. Uh, this section is usually where an address or a rough location will appear. Um, and then there are other options that I will get into into the next slide, but basically this geo privacy button, if you took a photo somewhere maybe you don't want the location to be known to the public, you can change this to private. Um, and then if what you saw happens to be something rare or something that is of particular interest to a researcher, they can contact you to get for more information later on. So this is what it looks like when you use iNaturalist computer vision to suggest an ID. So you would click on that little um, question mark here. If you click on that, it'll look like this. You can look up a species by name or iNaturalist will suggest things for you. And if they are visually similar and seen nearby, they will float to the top of the suggestions. And they'll also have this label here. Now, it's still computer vision, so it's worth getting out a field guide, perhaps, or looking at other online resources to make an ID, not just going off of this alone. But it'll certainly give you somewhere to start. Um, we can say with reasonable confidence that it is in this genus. And iNaturalist also has these suggestions that look pretty good, too they'll suggest 10 species for you to choose from. I know that this was a California poppy in my yard because it doesn't have quite the characteristics for a tufted poppy. So I will click on that and that shows up as the identification over here, finishing out that details screen when I make my observation. Once you've entered all the information in that section, you hit share to upload. Here's a few more considerations, questions you might have. So this captive or cultivated section is really interesting. You'll notice it has 
a fish in a fishbowl next to it. This is because you could make an observation of something you planted in your yard. You know, perhaps a plant that you got from a nursery or from seeds that you bought. You could certainly upload it, but you would want to mark that it was cultivated, that you planted it, and you didn't observe it growing wild. And I would imagine, although I haven't really seen this, you could take pictures of your pets as well <laughs> and mark that they were there, but you would also want to put that they are captive. You can edit the sharing capabilities on your photos. Photos that are uploaded to iNaturalist have a specific Creative Commons license that allows them to be shared with attribution. That's the default. However, you can change that to private in your photo settings on the app. This part's important. This is what makes iNaturalist so unique and an amazing resource. resource. Your observation is incomplete without an additional identification from the iNaturalist community. That makes it research grade. It's like getting a peer review on a paper. So I made an observation of a box elder tree and then just four minutes later, someone else too agreed with me that it was a box elder. Now that observation is research grade and it can be uploaded to those other scientific databases um, and used in official species lists. Finally, last note, you can upload sounds. I am not quite such an iNaturalist aficionado that I have done that. I cannot say, I didn't fully do my homework there but I know that it can be done. So if you like to get out and record birds, that would be great. And I'm sure greatly appreciated and really fun for the iNaturalist community to see. So what if you don't like to go out and take pictures with your phone? Maybe you have a nice camera that you'd like to use with a zoom lens so you can get those pesky birds that are so far away or always flying away from you, or maybe if you see turtles on a log, that's great. You can definitely do that. Um, and it really kind of opens the door for what's possible to observe. So you can upload observations from your computer. If you upload pictures from your camera to your computer, you would just open iNaturalist in your web browser and log into your account, go to your observations, and then you can hit this add observations or upload button. They'll both take you to the same place. It looks a little different than using the app on your phone, but it's that same details page, that species occurrence information. If your camera doesn't have GPS capabilities, you will need to manually enter the location and the date. Some cameras do have that. And iNaturalist will still suggest species for you once you start typing in something on that species name section. It will still make these suggestions for you to consider. And once again, if you already know, you can enter it yourself or keep it pretty general. That is how to make an observation on iNaturalist. And that leads me to what are we making these observations for? What is a bioblitz? Well, <laughs> usually bioblitzes look a lot more like this. Everyone gather real close together to look at something tiny or everyone gathered together to learn more about the preserve where they are. People making observations of nature together. Bioblitzes are gatherings of scientists, citizen scientists, land managers, and more. All working together to find and identify as many different species as possible. Bioblitzes not only help land managers build a species list, an atlas for their park, or in this case, watershed, 
um, and they provide invaluable data for researchers. They also highlight the incredible biodiversity in the specific areas where they are held. Biobuses are open to anyone and family friendly. You just have to bring a smartphone to these events, or as you can see, you can also bring your big cameras as well um, and help catalog all the natural wonders you see in a specific place. Usually bio blitzes have an in-person component where you go around the preserve in teams and see how much you can see and you come back to a central location to share what you discovered. However, we all know there's no getting that close together right now, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that a bio blitz is not possible. And something that I find really inspiring about these events is that they are so flexible. And we have chosen to do our first bio blitz during a time where it necessitates that it is done somewhat in isolation. You can do it with other folks in your household, of course. Um, but the Laguna de Santa Rosa Community Bio Blitz will be done around the watershed during California Biodiversity Week by individuals all contributing to this project. This is what a bio blitz looks like on iNaturalist. Now, the term really refers to the event itself, but since we don't have an in-person event, this is the project that we all have in common. I set this up, it's basically a portal or a starting point for this event. And this page, iNaturalist, the project that I set up, will gather the data that you collect throughout the week and report it out all in one place. So I can tell you, you know, this began September 5th and some of you have already been busy out there making observations which is amazing considering the weekend that we had. Um, our project already has 225 observations with 135 different species, 39 observers, and eight project members, which is great. So this project will collect data that anyone collects within the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed boundaries during this time. If you join the project as a member, then I can reach out to you specifically about any observations you make, um, and that'll help with my reporting of the data at the end of the project. Like I said, it looks a little different, and I wanna encourage all of you as you're going out there making observations of plants and animals you find in the Laguna watershed to do it safely. I think this image is super cute. <laughs> Keep your paws clean. I love this one the most because raccoons actually wash their hands. Um, but this has some good reminders. And I would add my own recommendations that I have found it's really helpful to explore at odd hours. Either go really early or really late. And that's a great time to see more critters too. Take the road less traveled. That's also great for the bio blitz because you might observe things that other people are less likely to see. And of course, we encourage wearing a mask and keeping a six foot distance when you're around other people out in our parks, in your neighborhood, um, anywhere outside your backyard. All right. That takes us through our first section, the nitty gritty details of how to contribute to the virtual community bio blitz. I'd imagine there might be some questions out there. That was a lot of detail, so, but if not, great. <laughs> how does it look out there, Christine? Um, we're just starting to get uh, a couple questions. And the first one is, how do you count numbers of a species? Um, and can people access the project through the app? Um, so how would someone find the project if they go into iNaturalist? Good question. You can search for the Laguna de Santa Rosa Community Bio Blitz. Um, 
the easiest way to find it is if you signed up for this event, which you did because you got this link, um, in one of the emails I've sent you from Eventbrite, all of them have the link to the iNaturalist project. It'll take you right there specifically. Um, and then you can kind of track the progress of the project through that page. What will happen is when you're making an observation, if you are within the Laguna watershed boundaries, when you are making your observation, it will automatically count towards this project. That's the way I've set it up on iNaturalist. It's called an umbrella project. So it captures, it gets a really good idea of the biodiversity that's out there. And so all people making observations within the watershed during that time, those observations will be counted on our project. That's great. And then you can also, if you navigate to that um, page, you can join as a member. And that's another way to help me narrow down which members were making the most observations, which is folks I know got um, that direct link and registered for this event. That's great. That umbrella project is really going to help us build a list for the Laguna. Um, another question that came through is, how do you authenticate someone else's observation? Do you know about that process, Allison? That is a great question. You can explore observations within the Laguna watershed boundaries. You can also click, if you go to that page I showed that BioBlitz project homepage, you can click on observations. It'll show you all the observations that are being made within our project. Some of them will have a little tab in the photo, this little green tab that says RG. That means research grade. So that means those observations have already been identified by more than one person. If they don't have that tab, you can help by adding an observation or an identification, excuse me. You can add an identification to someone else's observation. And that can be done through the project or it can be done just by hitting that explore button um, and exploring the observations within the Laguna watershed in general, either way. But that is a huge part of being in the iNaturalist community is not just contributing observations, but also identifications where you feel like you can. We have time for one more. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone is noticing that there's a Laguna Environmental Center biodiversity project and wondering if that's it. Um, that is a separate project, I know, because I started that one a couple of years ago, and we haven't quite taken off yet. So will you say the name of the project we're working on again? Yes, there are other projects that are related to the Laguna on iNaturalist. So look for the one with the Laguna Foundation logo, and it is called Laguna de Santa Rosa Virtual Community BioBlitz. Very good, thank you. Yeah, good question. But our logo is next to the one, the current one that we are doing. And when you navigate to the page, you'll see this beautiful fall image of the Laguna that I've been showing you on our agenda pages. And then you'll know you found the right one. Okay, very good. Good questions, yeah. All right. If that is all that we've got for now, we'll take more questions at the end too. So if these questions are kind of sparking more for you, more questions about iNaturalist, then we can come back to that. Um, but I am going to launch into the more about the Laguna watershed, the boundaries and the biodiversity that you can find out there in the fall, which is not a season that may occur to many to get out and really look for flora and fauna. Oh, the agenda is telling you what I just said. Okay, this is an important slide. 
Some of you may already be familiar with the boundaries of the Laguna watershed, but if not, this is a crucial image that will help you decide where to go and make observations this week. So this yellow line denotes the outer boundary of the Laguna watershed. The blue is, of course, streams and creeks. This big thick blue line here is the main channel of the Laguna de Santa Rosa. And then all of these creeks, these smaller creeks that come down from the mountains in the east, drain into this main channel of the Laguna, which then goes out to the Russian River. It is actually the largest tributary watershed to the Russian River. And this channel is 22 miles long and has an, a lot of amazing wetland habitat along its banks. And it's a huge watershed. There are a lot of places where you can make observations this week in a lot of different ecosystems too. If you live in Katati, Rohnert Park, Santa Rosa, Windsor, uh, Eastern Sebastopol, you likely live within the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed, which makes your backyard a place where you can make observations for the virtual community bio blitz. However, if you want to venture further afield and use this as an excuse to go explore somewhere new, I have a lot of suggestions for you. And this is not an exhaustive list. There are plenty more places than this. The places in bold are places that have ag and open space protected, they are ag and open space protected lands as well. So, of course, top of the list is the Laguna Trail. Second is Laguna Uplands Preserve, um, which some of you may be familiar with. We've done a lot of stewardship on that particular parcel. Um, in past years, but it's also just a beautiful view of the watershed out from that area um, and a great place to kind of mark the progress of the restoration we've done out there. If you want to get the exact location for that preserve, it's open to the public um, and a great place to look is the Sonoma County Ag and Open Space Protected Lands Interactive Map. Um, Santa Rosa Creek Trail is a great place, a nice wide trail, which is great for these times of social distancing. Prince Memorial Greenway and Santa Rosa Creek. Um, and there are so many other creek trails. I by no means could list them all here, but if you live in Santa Rosa, that is another great resource um, for looking for places to go. There are also creek trails in Rohnert Park and many regional parks that are within our watershed. Crane Creek and in the south, um, Taylor Mountain, which is also an ag and open space protected land, Spring Lake, Regal Ranch over in Sebastopol, and then Shiloh as well, and neighborhoods during this time. I mean, there is a lot of wildland urban interface <laughs> um, in this, in our watershed, there's a lot of observations that could be made just within neighborhoods. And I definitely encourage that. Same goes for your backyard. Um, one of the amazing things about the Laguna watershed is that so many people live within it and yet it is an amazing biodiversity hotspot. Um, and so documenting what lives what plants and animals live alongside us in our yards would be great information for this BioBlitz as well. And there is a lot to see in the fall. I know I am somebody who has a particular affinity for plants and so I don't think of fall as a time to getting out there and make observations, but there really still is a lot happening. I, the following slides are all slides, just photos of the amazing biodiversity in the Laguna. 
Some of them, the ones that have low, little labels like this, I pulled directly from iNaturalist. They're photos that were taken in the last less than a month. They were from the, all from the end of August. Um, so that's real time what you can be seeing out there. Um, this is a photo of Oregon ash in Annadel State Park. And this is the box elder observation that I made, I talked about earlier. This is California wild rose, not in its rose form, but in another form where it's still possible to identify it in its fruit at the Laguna Environmental Center. Coyote brush, which blooms in the fall, and a Douglas fir pine cone. All of these are great different parts of plants that you can make observations of and maybe some fall foliage that might make it in there as well. There, those were kind of more trees and shrubs, but there are even some annuals hanging on and some hardy perennials. This here is California buckwheat. Um, this is I call this dove weed. I think it has other common names, but this is a native plant that pops up super late in the season. You may have been seeing that around um, in kind of open grassy areas. Mugwort along the Santa Rosa Creek Trail. Some of you may have seen the elegant Madia blooming on roadsides. It's commonly mis it's commonly thought to be an invasive plant, but it is a California native. And there are invasive plants like this pennyroyal out there as well. Of course, fall is a great time for raptors if the smoke clears up um, and you can kind of look up into clear skies. Uh, this is a Cooper's hawk right here and barn owl below. We've got a red-shouldered hawk, this beautiful wing feathers and chest feathers there, and a red-tailed hawk, as you can see. I also wanted to share this observation in particular because this was identified as a western screech owl from this photo of a feather. So feathers make for great observations as well. If you find them on your property or out on a hike, um, Document the feather where you found it. If you found if you found it on a hike, you know, take the picture there if you can to get that location data and upload it to iNaturalist later. And it can be helpful to have something for a sense of scale next to your feather. So um, any common item like a pen or something would be great as well. Um, and you, there are folks out there who can help you identify the bird that was there just based on that feather. And there are plenty of smaller birds and songbirds, water birds. Um, this here is our song sparrow, a resident, the Laguna woodpeckers, such as the downy woodpecker. This is a great smartphone photo of a chestnut-backed chickadee in Santa Rosa. Western wood peewee, which is a migrant. Um, herons along the creek banks, like along the Santa Rosa Creek Trail is a great place to observe them. This is a green heron. And this is a common yellow throat, a warbler species associated with wetlands. The hot weather does bring out raptors, or not raptors, excuse me, reptiles. It's a great time to observe those out in sunny places with care, as we know, um, you know, it also brings out, brings out all reptiles, including rattlesnakes. This is a king snake I saw last year on the Laguna Trail, just beautiful, it was such a treat to see it. Um, you might find amphibians closer to water, like the chorus frog or our western pond turtle and there are plenty of lizards all around Sonoma County. Our western fence lizard here smaller with a blue belly or the alligator lizard which has a larger head larger body in general. Um, so plenty of opportunities to see those as well. They are out more during the heat of the day um, although these days that 
<laughs> is most of the day. So good chance for seeing them. And of course, there's plenty of insects and this is great for the backyard observations. Um, there's moths like this fractured western snout, spotted cucumber beetle, honeybees. This is a cobalt milkweed beetle. Butterflies, still plenty of butterflies out, um, out and about, cabbage white. Um, fritillaries are also out now. And then even, you know, if you're getting annoyed by a wasp as you're having a picnic outdoors, it's just something you can definitely make an observation of, uh, like this yellow jacket here. Another fun thing to try and observe in the fall is galls, which are growths on a plant that are created by an insect, specifically gall wasps. They cause, they irritate the surface of the plant, the plant, and inject a chemical, and the plant creates this growth that they then use for laying eggs and for refugia for their young. So I think many of you have probably seen these California oak galls um, all around. They're a staple of the oak groves here in Sonoma County. But there are all other galls, plenty of different kinds of galls you can see. These ones, sunburst gall wasp that was seen in Sebastopol. These are also fairly common. Um, these little cone ones down here. And these were also seen in Santa Rosa, the pumpkin gall wasp. Now, it won't come up. You can't observe the gall. What you are observing is activity from a gall wasp, which is why all of these are named so. Mammals, of course, are a fun thing to, always a fun sight. That's what you'll see. You're more likely to see them early or late nowadays. I just had the privilege of seeing a gray fox in Spring Lake Regional Park um, just the other morning. Um, some com more common ones you might see are bats. Um, I know I had a little bat friend living on my house growing up and this is what it looked like, just a little brown ball in the corner of my eaves. Gophers you are likely to see and probably resent in your garden. Deer, um, jackrabbit, and I just couldn't resist including this photo of the resident weasels in Regal Ranch, <laughs> um, the local celebrity. Um, they are really fun to see as well. Fungus is, uh, and lichens are fair game as well for uploading and making observations of. There is a lot of fungus biodiversity in this area. Um, it's not quite the time for a lot of them, but you, may, you never know. Um, certainly a great time for observing lichen um, and larger fungus like turkey tails. Uh, there are some later fungus coming up in the forest. Um, these are boletes. And then this was just observed recently, this red cage fungus in Sebastopol. Okay, so that takes us that was a lot of species in a little amount of time. Um, I hope that gets you excited about going out and looking around. I know for me, there's nothing quite like observing plants and animals to take me out of my day-to-day -day worries and release some of that heaviness that we may be feeling. So I hope that that inspires you to look closely and upload some observations to our project. And there may have been questions while I was going on and on about all of those plants and animals. So, Christine, are there any questions in the chat? There are, aren't no more questions in the chat at this point, but maybe someone will type one as we're talking about it. Um, Feel free. Yes, okay, mm -hmm. here it is. <laughs> what will you do with the data? Great question. So I will be looking at the data and going through it every day to try and help um, get the, as many observations to research grade as possible so that this data can be used um, to, for a species list of the Laguna watershed, number one, um, and for any other projects that come up in the future. Um, I will also 
we don't have like specific plans at the Laguna Envir at the Laguna Foundation for right now, but just having all of this data in the watershed, knowing what's out there and knowing what is specifically out there this time of year will be helpful for generations to come. As long as iNaturalist is around, it will be useful data to us. And when we have ideas for different monitoring projects or stewardship projects in the future, this data can help inform those efforts as well. Another thing is that if there's anything that comes up that is striking, unusual, um, out of the ordinary per se, um, that is worth noting. That is something I will be looking for. Um, and there are people out there who may be interested in what we find. Um, if there's something that comes up that looks a little unusual. Um, I know that our team, our restoration team is interested in invasive plant populations that you all find just sort of loosely um, within the watershed. So there may be more interest like that that comes out of the observations you are making. And I will compile that data and send it to you at the end of the week, um, kind of reporting out how many observations were made. And if there was anything of particular interest to our restoration team or to us at the Laguna Foundation or in general, in terms of fall biodiversity for Sonoma County. Great. Um, let's, maybe we should address this question about collecting observations on private property. We have, what are our recommendations about that? If it's your private property, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's up to you whether, like I said, up to you whether you want to share that location with everyone. Um, you can make it private. I uh, do not condone trespassing on private property to make observations. However, if you are walking in a neighborhood and you are observing something that might be in someone's yard right out front, you know, if you're walking along on the sidewalk and you see something, that might be a good time to use that captive cultivated section. If you see something that's particularly strange um, and you want to note it, you can note that it's in a neighborhood without saying exactly where. Um, as, yeah, that's about all I've got in terms of <laughs> private property. Do you have anything to add, Christine? <laughs> well, I think you're right. We're definitely not going to trespass. You may have permission to be on private uh, property parcels. And of course, if you have permission, um, we would love to have the observations because as we all know, most of the Laguna watershed is within private ownership. Um, so we don't often have access to a lot of these lands. So maybe you do have special permission and that will certainly help expand our knowledge base. Um, we do have species lists for the Laguna, um, but this sort of work that we're doing as a community is really going to help us populate those lists and create um, baseline data um, in a digital format that we're going to be able to use for years to come, just like Allison pointed out. Um, one more question about making observations, Allison. Um, in the notes section, um, is that where you put uh, something like the bird was feeding on a coffee berry plant or the bird was preening? Um, is, is that useful generally for the observations to put notes like that in there? Yes, I think it's useful. Um, notes like that would certainly go in a species occurrence record that would live at somewhere like the Cal Academy. I have used that often making my own observations. When I made an observation recently of a feather and put a ruler next to it, I mentioned where we found it. Um, I mentioned that I had already looked it up in this one resource and that I couldn't find it. Um, so any notes that you have, I think notes on habitat, if you saw it with other species, um, it's a good record for its use as data, but it's also a good record for yourself, which I want to, it is really helpful to have those notes for you too, in your personal species list and for noticing patterns you're observing in your lifetime. Oh, great. Um, well, the messages are starting to roll in, thanking us um, because people now know how to use iNaturalist. And oh, I good. I feel that way. That's my I feel more empowered to go out and make these observations. So thank you for sharing all that information. 
Great. Thank you all. Um, I, you know, I hope that you find some really interesting things out there for you personally and to share with everyone here. If you have more questions about how to use iNaturalist, I am here all week ready to answer those questions. So please write down my email and feel free to reach out. Um, this recording, this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you're making your first observation and feeling a little daunted or confused, you can refer back to this as well. Anything else to add, Christine, before I close this out? I just put your email address in the chat and that's allison at lagunafoundation.org. So thanks for offering that bit of support. Um, yeah, and thank you for teaching us all how to use iNaturalist. It, it was felt very comprehensive and uh, again, empowering, so thank you. Good. I'm glad. I hope that it does empower you to try and try it out. Um, thank you all for joining us and thank you to the Cal Academy for their support to me for helping set this up to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, who I've also been working with to launch this event, to Ag and Open Space, Sonoma County. It's so exciting that this is our first event together and that we are able to pull this off um, in socially distant times. So, and thank you all really for making this first BioBlitz a success. I'm excited to host more of these in person in the future on ag and open space lands around the watershed and get to explore more together and make those observations together. But this will have to do in the meantime. So thank you all for your support. <laughs> it's a great start, Allison. Thanks for starting our path. Yeah. Yeah. So. If you are interested in more virtual programs, the community education program is just revving up for the fall, mostly virtual at this point in time. Uh, there is an early career conservationist panel that will be on September 22nd. That's our next event. This whole month, in addition to being the month of celebrating California biodiversity, this whole month is California Coastal Cleanup Month. Uh, we usually have in-person cleanups along the main channel of the Laguna. This year, it will be similar to the BioBlitz, all trash collecting on your own and recording it using an app. Yes, there's an app for everything, I swear. Um, so you can join that. We're also doing a youth challenge associated with the Coastal Cleanup Month. If you know a person from 10 to 18 years old that can pick up trash and record it on an app. We can, we want to give them ice cream and some Laguna swag for their efforts. So you can get that information on our website as well. And there will be more events to come. So check back in with us. And please, please do reach out if you have questions please send me pictures or if you get really excited about something, I would love to chat about what you're finding out there during the community bio blitz. So don't hesitate. And once again, thank you all for coming. Uh, have a good evening. <laughs> I will close it out here in just a few minutes. So bye everybody. Bye until next time. <laughs>